Honky was yelling, we got our rights, and busting in the bus window with an axe handle. That's when the kid next to me was cut. We put the girls on the floor because of the fine glass. Man, it was too much. And all the time, these dudes were screaming, we got our rights. Well, you got off light, sir. It's incredible to me that not more of you were hurt, even killed. If the state police had not fired tear gas into that mob, I don't know what would I don't get it. The course is we got to go to Lamar High School under this new integration setup, right? So these folks don't like the law. So they come after us with rocks and chains and axe handles. Man, they're crazy. Just like it's always been. You'll fight your right if your black get back. Justice for us in this country has been a long time coming. I'm not just talking about the right to go to a decent school in Lamar. Talking about the right to get a decent job in the mall. The right to buy a decent home in the mall. To be treated in a Lamar police precinct, a station house with decent respect. And I'm talking about all the Lamar, both north and south. But you're wrong when you say it's like it's always been. There are differences. What kind of differences that mean anything? They tried to beat us. They turned over our buses. And all the time they were crying about their rights. Well, what kind of rights do we have? What rights? Well, very simply, the rights guaranteed in the Constitution. The simple answers don't tell enough about us. For nearly 200 years, the courts denied that the rights guaranteed in the Constitution applied equally to us. Nearly 80 years after the Constitution was adopted, the United States Supreme Court was still debating whether a black man could even be considered a citizen. When Dred Scott, a slave, moved with his master from a slave state to a free state, he appealed to the United States Supreme Court for his freedom, claiming protection of the Constitution. And in 1856, Chief Justice Taney ruled on his case. It cannot be believed that large slaveholding states regarded Negroes as included in the word citizens, or would have consented to a constitution which might compel them to receive Negroes as citizens. What does that mean? What do you mean? state? I want my constitutional rights. I want my freedom in this court. It's more than a century before the framing of our constitution. Negroes have been regarded as beings of an inferior order and altogether unfit to associate with the white race. So far inferior that Negroes had no rights which the white man was bound to respect. Therefore, this court is of the opinion that you are not a citizen within the meaning of the Constitution of the United States and not entitled to sue in its courts for your freedom. But the Constitution says, damn, we got our rights. 
Courtrooms mean different things to different people, like the law itself. When you're a citizen with rights that are guaranteed, the law is your protector. This room is your refuge. But when you are told you are property, like Dred Scott, and you don't have rights, which the white man is bound to respect, the law is a tyrant. This courtroom becomes a terrifying place. Think of it. By court order, Scott and his entire family were returned to the living hell of slavery. They ain't gonna be in my grandson's class. There are those who say the Constitution itself was unfair. Some say it was designed by wealthy men of property for wealthy men of property. Some, like Jefferson, owned slaves. From its beginning, the Constitution defined a black to be only three-fifths of his white fellow Americans. When, in 1856, Justice Taney interpreted the Constitution as a racially biased document, he may have reflected the truth of that time in our history. But the Constitution is read differently by succeeding generations of Supreme Court. Almost 200,000 Negroes fought with the Union to destroy slavery. 38,000 black men died in the struggle. The Northern victory seemed to promise a new era of equality for the black American. But 200 years of master and servant couldn't be wiped away because a Southern army had surrendered. In the years of reconstruction that followed the war, black congressmen were mocked and stoned. Ballot boxes were stolen. Black voters were hounded by murderous bands of white vigilantes. And America, weary of the long war, turned its face away from the white violence, pretending not to see. In 1865, the 13th Amendment to the Constitution finally made the black a citizen. And in 1868, the radical Republicans, led by Thaddeus Stevens and Charles Sumner, forced through the Congress the 14th Amendment. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens. Now, that should have done it, right? There it was, signed, sealed, ratified by the state. It was law, and we were equal before the law. The amended Constitution of the United States said so. But it wasn't that easy. Senator Ben Tillman of South Carolina said, when inoculated with the virus of equality, the nigra becomes a fiend a wild beast seeking whom he may devour. <laughs> the virus of equality. Well, old Ben was right in one thing. The Civil War had inoculated a lot of us with the virus of equality, and we didn't want to be sure. During Reconstruction, we began to serve on juries and elect our own representatives to the legislatures and the Congress. But white America went right on arguing about what that 14th Amendment really meant. You see, nowhere in that amendment is the word segregation ever used. So a lot of folks, particularly in the South, argue that the Negro could be free and segregated. When President Rutherford Hayes pulled out the federal troops and let the South settle its own problems, Segregation was back in the saddle. Neither the president, nor the Congress, nor the courts seemed disposed to interfere. The Constitution ceased to exist for black Americans in the South. They're gonna wish they was never born. For a long time, the black American found only denial and humiliation in the courts. When Homer Plessy, a Negro, refused to move from a white railroad coach to a Jim Crow car in 1896, he was arrested. His appeal to the Supreme Court was rejected. Separate but equal facilities were found by the court to be constitutional. If one race be inferior to the other socially, 
The Constitution of the United States cannot put them on the same plane. Justice John Marshall Harlan dissented with the majority of the court. You are heaping on yourself a future of terror and violence by such a repudiation of the Constitution. Our Constitution is colorblind. And he was right. But until a majority of judges on the Supreme Court would agree, black Americans would find little better. In the late 20s, Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis advised the president of Howard University to make a fine law school which could turn out lawyers expert in constitutional law. These will be the men and women, he said, who will force the Supreme Court to grant Negroes their civil and constitutional rights. South Carolina's run out of time, run out of court. In the intervening years, many Howard-trained lawyers have helped revitalize the Constitution and completely change the role of the black American. One of the great ones is Thurgood Marshall. At Howard, for the first time, I found out my rights. In 1938, Marshall became the director counsel of the new NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund. During the next 23 years, Marshall built the Legal Defense Fund into a potent legal striking force. He fought cases through the Jim Crow courts of the South and brought them all the way to the United States Supreme Court. He went where it was dangerous to be a Negro, let alone one who was fighting racism with every legal tool. Of the 32 cases he brought to the highest court, he won 29. And the victories were the granite foundation for the emerging civil rights movement. And when court says go, you go, that's the law. When Marshall won a Supreme Court decision that outlawed all white primaries in Texas in 1944, it signaled the beginning of black political power in the South. If the Constitution were indeed colorblind, then politics must be colorblind as well. When Marshall won a Supreme Court decision that outlawed Jim Crow transportation between states, this country finally removed a disgraceful insult to Homer Plessy and every black American. When Marshall won a Supreme Court decision that struck down unfair agreements which would restrict the sale of houses in certain neighborhoods to members of one race, it was the beginning of a long struggle that would finally remove another roadblock to black equality. And when Marshall fought successfully against the use by courts of confession, forced by physical means by the police, every American's civil liberties were strengthened. What is striking to me is the importance of law in determining the condition of the Negro. Just from realize, he was effectively enslaved, not by brute force, but by a law which declared him a chattel of his master. He was given a legal right to recapture him, even in free territory. He was emancipated by law, and then disfranchised and segregated by law. And finally, he's beginning to win equality by law. Court, non-legal, even illegal events, can significantly affect the development of the law. But I submit the history of the Negro in this country demonstrates the importance of getting rid of hostile laws and seeking the security of new friendly laws, federal, state, and local. But it was in 1963 in Brown versus the Board of Education that Marshall challenged the whole idea of separate but equal. Separate can never be equal. Equal means getting the same thing at the same time and in the same place. Even if the physical facilities and the separate racial schools were the same, he argued, there were additional factors that must be weighed. Black children were made to feel inferior by the majority's refusal to allow them to share their schools. Black children who were excluded too often began to believe that they were indeed 
second-class people. On May 17, 1964, the Supreme Court agreed. We conclude that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. William Patterson, an attorney who had fought for years for black justice in American courts, commented, it took from 1896 to 1954 to get the Supreme Court to reverse itself. The Supreme Court was the leading force in the violation of constitutional rights and guarantees for black Americans. Nevertheless, the victory was the legal trigger for a social revolution. With the successful challenge to separate but equal education, black America launched an assault on separate but equal in every avenue of American life. It was fitting that during the decade of the 60s, which saw a civil rights movement sweep across America, the country he had served so well honored Thurgood Marshall. His appointment to the United States Court of Appeals by President Kennedy in 1961 was opposed bitterly by Southern senators for almost a year. But his performance on the bench was a brilliant triumph. In more than 100 majority opinions that he wrote for the court, not one was to be reversed by the Supreme Court. When he became Solicitor General of the United States, he successfully defended the government position in 14 of 19 cases. I don't know if you've had an opportunity to see the afternoon papers, but when Solicitor General Thurgood Marshall was supposed to be with you, he was with me. Actually, in my office, I was informing him that I wanted him to accept appointment the Supreme Court of the United States. And the Senate willing, uh, he will become Associate Justice, succeed uh, Justice Clark. He has accepted. His appointment to the United States Supreme Court, its first Negro justice, was confirmed by the Senate in 1967. President Johnson said, I believe it is the right thing to do, the right time to do it, the right man and the right place. The battle Marshall waged so well and so long continues. The Legal Defense Fund, from its beginning under Thurgood Marshall, has sought to find black lawyers in the South who could assist in the struggle. But even today, there is only one black attorney for every 37,000 blacks in the South. Yet the poor and the uneducated black continue to be the most likely victim of the denial of legal rights. Now, a new generation of Thurgood Marshall has struggled to make the Constitution live. Only strict enforcement of the bitterly won laws can ensure equality in housing, equality in jobs, equality in education, equality before the law. On September 5th, 1957, a United States court order to desegregate Little Rock Central High School was openly defied by Arkansas Governor Orville Forbes. He ordered the National Guard to stop the nine black children ordered to the school. In a move to enforce the Constitution, President Dwight Eisenhower ordered a battalion of airborne federal troops to carry out the court order and escort the black children to the school. Certain misguided persons, many of them imported into Little Rock by agitators, <coughs> have insisted upon defying the law and have sought to bring it into disrepute. The orders of the court have thus been frustrated. The very basis of our individual rights and freedoms rests upon the certainty that the president and the executive branch of government will support and ensure the carrying out of the decisions of the federal courts, even when necessary, with all the means at the president's command. The overwhelming majority of our people in every section of the country are united in their respect for observance of the law, even in those cases where they may disagree 
with that law. They deplore the call of extremists to violence. So I call upon the citizens of the state of Arkansas to assist in bringing to an immediate end all interference with the law and its processes. Thus will be restored the image of America and of all its parts as one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It's a measure, Cliff, of how far we've come and how far we've yet to go. Contrary to the science of Little Rock and the science of the Mar, South Carolina in March 1970. The court ordered integrated education in a single system immediately. Here in Lamar, those 200 angry whites determined to force the court to reverse its decision. They thought they could do that by using violence, by attacking your buses with rocks and chains. 30 in that mob have already been arrested. Man, they got air panels there running over those children. Governor McNair used force to protect black children from mob violence. If the safety of our children is not sacred to all men, then the entire process of law and government is meaningless. Now, he didn't say the safety of our white children. He said the safety of our children. All our children. Constitution is only words on paper. Yes. They only live when people make them. A southern governor proclaiming in 1970 that all life is sacred gives the lie to a southern chief justice who said in 1856 that no white man is bound to respect the rights of a Negro. Only when the rights of the Constitution are securely in the hands of the poor man, the one official, black, brown, red and yellow men, those white men, when the Constitution promises justice, there is equal place of law. Hey, y'all, look at that sign out there. Welcome to Lamar. You think they mean welcome? 